Inventors and their wondrous inventions have shaped society since the beginning of time, always searching for ways to make life easier, better, and more convenient. With each new discovery, inventors throughout the ages have harnessed energies that increased the speed of a journey and sent exploration to the far reaches of the universe. They have expanded the threshold of communications from a crude phone system that needs wires to relay the human voice to a cellular system that needs no wires at all. A tireless bustle of inventiveness surged through the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries, bringing forth a new horizon of technology, the application of science to the industrial and commercial needs of the world. Often to their own amazement, inventors created more efficient ways to light homes, bring music to our ears, and to improve the way we produce and prepare our food. Let's meet some of the significant inventors of those times. Mention the name Benjamin Franklin, and most people immediately think inventiveness. In 1733, Franklin began his first trade, which was printing. As a printer, he published the immensely popular Poor Richard's Almanac, which was noted for Franklin's concise and meaningful statements like, God helps those that help themselves, lost time is never found again, and early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. As a community activist, he was instrumental in establishing the first US lending library in 1731 as well as an academy in 1751 that evolved into the University of Pennsylvania. Among his many achievements, he was made Postmaster General and greatly improved the efficiency of the Postal Service. He organized the first fire company in Philadelphia and introduced methods for the improvement of street paving and lighting. Franklin was respected as a unique and practical observer of life a man who could combine a scientist's curiosity with a tinkerer's skill. He devised a method to correct the excessive smoking of chimneys through his invention of the Franklin stove, which furnished greater heat with a reduced use of fuel. His curiosity led to experiments involving electricity. In 1752, he conducted his famous experiment with a kite devised to demonstrate that lightning was an electrical discharge. The kite had a metal point on it, and when lightning struck it, sent a spark to the key that Franklin had attached to the cotton string. His discovery led him to invent an electric generator, as well as lightning rods, which were attached to the top of the houses to draw lightning away from the houses themselves. In 1760, he invented bifocal lenses for eyeglasses. This meant that two types of prescriptions could now fit on the same lens. From 1757 to 1762, and from 1764 to 1765, Franklin represented the American colonist in London, England. On his return to America, he actively promoted the revolutionary cause and was one of the five men who drafted the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Franklin also secured the vital support of France for the American Revolution. Shortly after his participation in the Constitutional Convention, he retired and spent his last years corresponding with friends and receiving visitors. His posthumously published autobiography, written for his son, William Franklin, is considered a classic piece of literature. It was Franklin's nature to advance what he called common living. He never sought fame or fortune from his patents and inventions, and not all of his ideas were equally accepted. For example, Franklin introduced the soybean to this country, but American farmers ignored it for more than a century. Robert Fulton spent his youth in Philadelphia and worked as a jeweler's apprentice, gunsmith, and painter. Then, at the age of 20, he ventured to England to study under the artist Benjamin West. His paintings made little impression, and despite his lackluster promise as an artist, Fulton remained abroad for 20 years. 
he discovered new interests, mechanics and engineering. From his fascination of water transport systems, he published a treatise on the improvement of canal navigation in 1796. During his stay in France from 1797 to 1806, Napoleon encouraged Fortin to develop the Nautilus diving boat, or submarine. However, he failed to receive the necessary research funds from either the French or the British governments and returned to the United States. In August 1807, Fortin was encouraged to complete his steamboat, the Claremont, which was one of the first steamships ever built. The Claremont made its first trial run on the Hudson River. Within a month, Fulton began commercial trips that carried passengers and light freight between New York City and Albany. Mechanical difficulties and jealous sloop boatmen who ran the Claremont's unprotected paddle wheels hampered his business. Undaunted, he stiffened and widened the hull, fitted guards over the wheels and made other adjustments. He would construct other ships and encounter many difficulties, but his work was primarily responsible for demonstrating that steam could be a practical source of power on the water. By 1810, three of Fulton's boats served the Hudson and Raritan rivers. His steamboats replaced the horse ferries that were used for heavily traveled river crossings in New York, Boston, and Philadelphia. In the end, however, most of Fulton's wealth was spent on litigation to protect his patents. Nevertheless, he is remembered as a visionary who recognized the importance of conquering great distances with the strongest power source available at the time. By his thirties, Samuel Morse was a successful portrait painter. In 1825, he helped found the National Academy of Design in New York City and became the first president of the Academy. He continued painting and became a professor of painting and sculpture at New York University in 1832. About the same time, he became fascinated by electricity. In Europe and in the United States, in the early 1800s, inventors were using electricity to send messages over wires. Morse was intrigued and he began laying out plans for his first telegraph machine while returning across the Atlantic from Europe in 1832. By 1835, he created a model telegraph and developed a complex system of dashes and dots designed to easily transmit language and numbers over the wires. The code became known as the Morse Code and emerged as the International Communication System. With government funding for his invention, Morse was able to construct a small telegraph system along a railroad line between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland. On May 24, 1844, Morse sent the first public telegram. The text of the telegram was, What hath God wrought? The honor of choosing the words was given to Annie Ellsworth, daughter of the Commissioner of Patents. The words indicated the level of fear of the new technology. And indeed, it would hasten a revolution in communication both in the United States and throughout the world. Abraham Lincoln became the first American president to direct armies via the telegraph during the Civil War. By 1869, the first telegraph line connected the East and West Coast. Soon news throughout the world could be transmitted over the telegraph lines. In the early 1900s, thousands of Western Union telegraph offices appeared across the country, connecting the ever-expanding frontier of the United States. Receiving and sending a telegram became both exciting and common for the masses. A long legal battle ensued over the patent. Morse was not technically the inventor of the telegraph but he did experiment with it extensively enough to be awarded the patent in 1854. Born in 1847 in Edinburgh, Scotland, Alexander Graham Bell was the son of a respected teacher of the deaf. He joined his father in promoting an innovative language for the deaf called visible speech. Bell emigrated to Canada 
in 1870 and to the United States in 1871. In 1872, he founded a school for the deaf in Boston, Massachusetts. One of his students was a young Boston heiress named Mabel Hubbard, who lost her hearing from a severe attack of scarlet fever when she was five. They fell in love and married five years later, only after Bell felt he had proved himself through his invention of the telephone. Bell had developed the basic ideas for the telephone in 1874 while working on a multiple telegraph. On March the 10th, 1876, his experiments with the telephone proved successful when he transmitted the first complete sentence to his assistant, Thomas Watson. On that day, the famous words, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you, led to subsequent demonstrations and an entire new industry. In 1877, he organized the Bell Telephone Company. During the early years of their marriage, Alexander and Mabel's worst quarrels were over the late hours he would keep. Bell's insatiable curiosity often kept him awake until four o'clock in the morning. But it was during these hours that his inventive nature resulted in amazing strides in the understanding of the behavior of sound waves passing through the air and frequencies sent over electric wires. With the financial assistance of the Volta Prize bestowed on Bell by the French, he founded the Volta Laboratory in Washington, D.C. Through continued experiments, his list of inventions grew to include the audiometer, used to measure the acuity in hearing, the induction balance, used to locate metal objects in human bodies, and the first wax recording cylinder, introduced in 1886. Alexander Graham Bell was one of the original members of the National Geographic Society and served as its president from 1898 to 1904. After 1895, Bell's interest turned to aeronautics and he pondered ways to give man wings. His study of flight began with the construction of large kites and in 1907, he devised a kite capable of carrying a person. With a group of associates, he furthered man's desire to fly. He also applied the principles to travel on water. By 1917, his final full-size hydrodome reached speeds of 70 miles an hour and for many years was the fastest boat in the world. Up until his death in August 1922, Bell studied the causes and heredity of deafness. Stiff-colored portraits of the Wright brothers reveal little of the daring of these American pioneer aviators. Wilbur was born in 1867, Orville in 1871. Neither brother graduated from school. However, both Orville and Wilbur showed mechanical genius at an early age. In 1892, they opened the Wright Cycle Company, a bicycle sales and repair shop in Dayton, Ohio. Soon they were making and selling their own bicycles. Spurred by articles about experiments with gliders, the Wright brothers began to ponder the challenges of a flying machine. In 1899, they built their first glider and joined the aviation adventurers who swooped and bounced in a variety of flying devices. After studying the flights of buzzards and experimenting with kites, the Wright brothers enhanced their flying machine by adding motor-driven propellers. On December the 14th, 1903, they took their new invention, known as the Wright Flyer, to Kill Devil Hill at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Their first attempt at flight with Wilbur at the controls was a failure. After three days of repairs and adjustments, the Wright brothers were ready for another try on December the 17th, this time with Orville piloting the flyer. No newsmen came to see the Wright flyer. Only four men and a boy came to watch Orville climb into their flyer. One bystander, 
John Daniels, snapped photographs of the nervous attempt that became the first recorded flight of a heavier-than-air powered flying machine, lasting a full 12 seconds. Three more flights increased the flyer's range to 852 feet and its endurance to nearly a minute. The obscure bicycle makers from Ohio made aviation history and became the center of much attention. Before long, they became weary of explaining the principles of their flyer's performance. To the ever inquisitive, they simply responded, the aeroplane stays up because it doesn't have time to fall. However, in their typical methodical approach, they set about to perfect their invention and secure their patent. In 1906, their patent was issued and the Wright Brothers Company flourished. Wilbur died in 1912 and a sad Orville sold the company in 1915. But Orville Wright lived until 1948 and witnessed the incredible expansion of the science of flight that was now poised to reach the moon, the planets and beyond. George Washington Carver was born to slave parents in the small town of Diamond, Missouri. Though he was a sickly child, George impressed others with his knowledge of nature and extraordinary intellect. However, because of the color of his skin, he was not allowed to attend the local school. Thus, at an early age, he began a series of moves to further his education, supporting himself along the way through odd jobs. Finally, in 1890, he enrolled at Simpson College in Indianola, Iowa. At Simpson, Carver majored in art, but a teacher convinced him to transfer to Iowa State College to study agriculture. By 1896, Carver had a master's degree in agriculture and was respected for his incredible talent in horticulture. He accepted an offer from Booker T. Washington to head the agricultural department at the All Black Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. When not in class, he was engaged in some of his most significant work, seeking solutions to the burden of debt and poverty that plagued landless black farmers. Carver's research and innovative educational programs showed farmers how to increase soil fertility without commercial fertilizers and the benefits of growing alternative crops to cotton. To enhance the attractiveness of these alternative crops, Carver also developed a variety of uses for them. Peanuts were of special interest to him. He recognized that peanuts were an inexpensive source of protein that did not deplete the soil as much as cotton did. After many long years of experimentation, Dr. Carver found more than 350 uses for peanuts sweet potatoes and pecans, including plastics, lubricants, facial cream, and tapioca. George Washington Carver was an agricultural visionary, and his contributions broke ground for the racial advancement of African Americans. In 1951, his birthplace was established as a national monument. Nikola Tesla was born in Croatia in 1856 and educated in Austria and Czechoslovakia. He worked in Paris before moving to the United States in 1884 to seek support for one of his inventions. In 1885, he was an associate to Thomas Edison before the two quarreled and Tesla left to start his own laboratory. Eventually, he was forced out of his own firm. Undaunted, he continued his work and created an electromagnetic motor that would be basic to most alternating current machinery. In 1888, he sold the patents to his system of generating and transmitting AC power to George Westinghouse and worked for his company for a year before quitting. 
On his own, he continued to produce some important inventions involving high-frequency electricity and his alternating current system that illuminated the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. His work led to the construction of the Niagara Falls Hydroelectric Generating Plant in 1896. His reputation among his fellow scientists was at its peak, but Tesla became more reclusive and continued to work at new inventions, including one for wireless transmission of electricity and one for radio-controlled craft. The Tesla, a unit of magnetic flow density, is named after him. Thomas Alva Edison, the greatest inventor of his or any age, was born in Milan, Ohio on February the 11th, 1847, and was raised in Michigan. At the age of seven, Edison caught scarlet fever, which would leave him hard of hearing for the rest of his life. Edison was homeschooled by his mother, and by the age of 12, was selling fruit, candy, and newspapers on the Grand Trunk Railroad. But he also kept himself busy with experiments of every kind. As a young man, he was exempt from Civil War military service due to his deafness, and instead worked as a tramp telegrapher, moving from one railroad town to another, which finally delivered him to Boston. There he found himself among the scientifically inspired minds of a new age of electrical power and mass communication. In 1869, Edison realized that his efforts to improve transmitters and receivers for the telegraphs were only a glimpse of the possibilities. There was more to invent and money to be made. Edison applied for his first patent for an invention in October 1868. It was an electric vote counter intended for the United States Congress. Members of the Congress, however, were reluctant to use it. His first commercial invention was a failure. While working for a telegraph instrument maker, Edison invented the stock ticker, which was an adaptation of the telegraph. It sent the latest stock prices electrically along wires to printers in various offices. In 1870, Western Union paid Edison the unheard of sum of $40,000 for the patent to an improved stock ticker. With his newfound wealth, Edison decided to set up his own factory in Newark, New Jersey, and began to manufacture stock tickers and other devices. Determined to perfect rapid and cheap invention, Edison assembled a staff of men who offered various talents to detect bugs or imperfections in whatever devices needed improving. In 1876, Edison's carbon telegraph transmitter for Western Union Telegraph marked a significant advance towards making Bell's telephone practical. With the money Edison received from Western Union for the transmitter, he established his invention factory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, calling it the first industrial research laboratory in America. Successes resulted in more than 300 patents for items large and small, such as generators, switches, and sockets, and safety fuse boxes. Edison was hailed the Wizard of Menlo Park, a man of mighty impact on American culture. In 1877, Edison invented the phonograph, a device by which sound could be recorded onto a tinfoil cylinder. His invention would eventually lead to the compact displayers and stereo systems we use today. Edison made the first practical incandescent lamp in 1879, and it was patented in the following year. After months of testing metal filaments, Edison and his staff examined 6,000 organic fibers from around the world before deciding that Japanese bamboo was the best. Mass production soon made lamps, although low price, very profitable. In 1888, Thomas Edison invented the kinetoscope. It was a cabinet containing a strip of film with a sequence of pictures on it. A small hole inside the cabinet allowed the viewer to watch the film at a rapid pace. 
This created the illusion of movement in the pictures. Thus the term motion pictures was born. Being a businessman, Edison quickly added a coin drop to his invention so he could profit from it. The cost of viewing one of Edison's motion pictures? Five cents. As the 20th century began, Edison's lab continued to roll out successful inventions. These included improved storage batteries and a motor-driven phonograph with wax records. At one point in his career, someone remarked on the huge number of failures Edison had encountered in his search for a new storage battery. 50,000 experiments before he achieved the desired results. Results, said the inventor. Why, I have gotten a lot of results. I know 50,000 things that won't work. Never a scientist, Edison approached the challenges from a technical point of view. Altogether, his efforts surpassed all other inventors, with over 1,300 US and foreign patents to his credit. Thomas Edison died in West Orange, New Jersey, on October the 18th, 1931. His famous cluttered lab was preserved by another great inventive mind, Henry Ford. An array of inventive and creative personalities serve society well, developing sophisticated machines and always striving to improve these machines and their applications. They often found a way to make the quality of our lives better, but only after numerous failed attempts and a great amount of time and money. Thomas Edison once said, what people choose to call genius is simply hard work. 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration.